Educational Leadership Podcast with ID3 for Isaiah Drone III. Welcome to another impactful night of the Impact Educational Leadership. This is episode 68. I'm your host, ID3 for Isaiah Drone III. Tonight's panelists are Buddy Thornton. Buddy Thornton, please say hello to the people. Hello, everybody. Honored to be here. And we have Rick and Jen Bole. Please say hello to the people. Hi, folks. Glad to be here. Good evening. Glad to be here. And we have pro NFL player, Curly Scales. Mr. Scales, please say hello to the people. That's former player, hello. Good evening. Absolutely, absolutely. We thank you all for being here. Tonight's topic is sports and positive youth development. Sports offers a way to learn sport and life-based skills. Most sports program environments have a nurturing and supportive environment with high expectations, which in most cases uh, give youth the chance to develop positive relationships and connections with adults, peers, and the larger community. Positive youth development practices support young people with development skills that will empower them to succeed in school, in family relationships, and in community. Sports provides an interactive way to learn. Positive youth development builds on learners' five C's. The five C's are competence, confidence, connection, caring, compassion, and character. The sixth C is contribution. It is attained when a person has more fully realized those five C's. Positive youth development is an all-inclusive background outlining the supports all young people need to be successful. Tonight, we will have a conversation about sports and positive youth development. Our first panelist tonight is Mr. Buddy Thornton. Mr. Buddy Thornton, please tell the listening audience a little bit about yourself and what you're doing currently. Well, first of all, I want to uh, say a, a welcome to all my esteemed panelists. Uh, and in keeping with our theme of uh, sports and extracurricular activities, uh, I'm going to focus my uh, uh, short introduction on that I'm a retired professional bowling association member, spent more than two decades on tour, and <clears throat> the sports environment is such an impactful part of people's lives that uh, this is such a wonderful way to impart some of the experience and some of the attributes that uh, have been part of our uh, uh, 
process of going through being a professional athlete in front of people and with people. A absolutely, absolutely. You know, when I, I, I think of your name, especially in this conversation, the first word that comes to me is scaffolding, right? And that is a very powerful uh, concept. It's a powerful concept, uh, not only for uh, team playing and, and winning games and supporting uh, young people while they're developing, but scaffolding is a support system for positive youth development. <clears throat> All right, so my question for you, uh, Mr. Buddy Th Thornton, is uh, what do educators need to do to continue to include youth in decision-making processes um, on youth sporting activities in the future and beyond COVID-19? I think I took your question and I actually broke it into two parts. One is what do educators need to do to include students in the decision making processes aligned with youth sporting activities in the future and with the sub question of how does authority figure and teacher modeling uh, and co-creation dynamics in school environments enhance meaningful youth development because one always leads to the other. Uh, as we em embrace the competitive spirit that we want to impart to our students, uh, we also have to include that we need to model some of the behaviors that we expect them to carry on through their life, and we need to allow them to have a voice and co-create how impactful that can be, not only on the athletes themselves, but on their associates in school, the people who uh, watch them play, the people who support them, the uh, people who are ancillary around the actual sports, so that there's a huge dynamic that uh, goes into not just for the athletes, but also to everyone in the school environment. Uh, teachers, teachers have to prepare the student athlete in particular to understand that this is not a, just solely about the athlete. It's about many of the things that go into being an athlete and developing at the same time. Some of the research that has been done shows that active children, active people in general, have a much more comprehensive, active uh, uh, neurocortex. They are able to perform at a higher level because they're uh, always at a resting state. They're engaged, their body has to adapt, so they become very, very involved in everything they do. They get very focused, they get very intense. So when you look at that, uh, teachers need to lead by example, they need to inspire, they need to be a mentor, they need to be a coach, not just the coach of the sport, but they need to be a coach of the child for life skills. They need to focus on teamwork, not on individualism, and they need to help provide a vision of what sports is, not just winning and losing, but the competitive environment. So being involved in sports and other meaningful school or extracurricular activities creates a highly charged growth environment for all participants, students, athletes, teachers, administrators, parents, siblings, who are the stakeholders? Those are the stakeholders. Society is the stakeholders. What are their roles? Well, you're either playing in front of or you're observing, supporting, and enjoying. So, you know, when you take a look at that context, sports is such an integral part of our society. We really need to delineate how many positive attributes we can define, and teachers need to focus on those positive attributes. The three, the C's that you provided, I break them down slightly differently. I think the C's in youth sports context is confidence, competence, character, collaboration, and communication. These are all things that not only do the student athletes uh, see, they feel, they, they bring it into their soul and they project it to others and it allows them to feel a part of something that's bigger than themselves. Within the self, you have a lot of other things. You have uh, perspective, you have persistence, you learn to go through the rigors of practice, you learn teamwork, how to be goal-oriented not only for yourself but for the people to your right and to your left. You have positive psychosocial development. You learn about roles, you learn about rules, 
And not only does that affect the sports environment, but it's something that can carry through your entire life. But being a, a past athlete and knowing that we have another panel member who was a past athlete, we try, try to focus on two different dynamics. We break it out as inside the lines and outside the lines. Everyone knows that inside the lines, you need to play hard. You need to strive for excellence. Teachers need to drive that. Coaches need to drive that. We need the student athletes to evolve for the better. Obviously, we look for character above all else. And to do that, we have to convince them that winning is not everything. You have to be willing to accept outcomes. There can only be one winner. There's always going to be a loser. But everybody can walk away as a winner as long as they have the right perspective and the right attitude about what sport really is. Because outside the lines, when the game's over, we have to understand that we need to seek relationships over rivalries. You know, it's okay when you're, when you're on the field, you need to beat each other up a little bit. You want to you wanna win at all costs, fairly, competitively. But you have to also understand that outcomes are fleeting. Even a Super Bowl winner still has to face another season the very next year. But honor, dignity, and respect is something you can carry with you forever. That's, that's really the essence of what teachers need to teach student athletes and the people who support student athletes. That the game is integral to our soul. It allows us to be more than ourselves, but at the same time, we need to embrace what it, we can carry on from the sports environment into our life. You know, Mr. Thorne, when I asked you that question, before I gathered that question, I had to make sure that this was going to be a proper handoff to start uh, this discussion tonight, because you are uh, the positive social change agent pro. And so I want to be careful that I can see and the listening audience could see through your lens. We could see that model. We can see uh, that infrastructure, that structure that you call co-creation. And from it, when I got it, because there was a lot, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna cut a slice from that pie, if you will. <clears throat> and what I got from that was when you participate, then it stimulates the mind, the vision, the perceptions, and it gives direction. And so what you told us is that when you teach our youth how to make uh, positive decisions and choices, then they lead to positive direction. And so we thank you for adding value to this panel discussion tonight and starting this off, sir. That was certainly my pleasure, and uh, I've, I'm just really, really chomping at the bit to hear what other people are going to offer as part of their contribution. Absolutely. And with that being said, our next panel is... And, and tonight, what comes to mind is the word vocabulary. But uh, our next panelist is uh, Mr. Rick Vole. And again, this man is one of the busiest working men in Texas. Uh, but Rick, welcome and please say hello to the people and tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. Hi, uh, my name is Rick Vole. I am a music teacher in the Colleen Independent School District. Uh, as I mentioned, I originally hailed from Pennsylvania. That's where I got uh, my undergraduate and graduate collegiate degrees in. And uh, I'm currently, like I said, teaching in Colleen and also I'm the president of Colleen Educators Association, uh, where I help advocate for employees in Colleen ISD. Uh, the word that comes to mind when I'm thinking about you is vocabulary. And why is because, well, <clears throat> when you talk, when, when I hear you teach, I always hear approaches, I always hear strategies uh, that, that we can use to enhance a higher order of thinking, right? And so I, that's what we expect from you uh, in these panels, discussions like tonight. And um, 
you know, I know there's not any pressure for you, but with that being said, uh, my question for you is how, how do we effectively honor and appreciate the younger leaders and their voices? You give them one. Uh, to me, what you're speaking of in that question, and, and thanks again for having me on, I really appreciate it. But what you're speaking of in that question, to me, is one about developing leadership. And my own personal experience is in a slightly different kind of support. Uh, I'm a huge marching band fan, and I know you're asking what marching band has to do with sports. Uh, I'll tell you, it has a competitive component, whether or not it's formalized by an award or a win or a trophy. Um, if you've never seen the clip of the ESPN crew hooking up a percussionist to an EKG and then watch his heart rate soar to over 180 beats per minute when standing on the sideline watching his friends march on a football field, by the way, that's the same heart rate as a marathon runner, uh, let me know. I'll gladly look it up for anyone and show it to them. Uh, the second thing is that it requires the same thing that sports teams require, the coordination of multiple parts into a cohesive and effective whole. Uh, my collegiate marching band experience was at Indiana, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, or IUP. Uh, the Beast of the East, as we were known, was comprised of over 200 student musicians, one additional staff member that helped out during band camp, an occasional graduate student assistant, and one director. And that's it. No huge coaching staff, no specialization for each section, just that. And we would pack stadiums of people that would come to watch us perform. And so, you know, how can one person, one director, one head coach, if you would, make this happen? Well, the mastermind that was behind this juggernaut when I was there was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Charles Casavant. Uh, and his master stroke was to not do, any, do everything. He had the students do a lot of it. I mean, yeah, he wrote the drill, and he guided how it and the music were taught in terms of the sequences and such. And it was his vision that we all followed. But the bulk of the actual teaching was done by student leaders within the band. And he, would, he used to say that teaching music and drill to 200 people is not a one-man job. And student leadership plays an important part in that band. And it was. And the ownership in the final product that he bestowed on them and on us while I was there manifested itself in so many ways. In the short term, it created a pride of self and confidence in, yourself, in oneself that caused the band to, to work to be its best. We did a, a lot of recruiting for the university back then and our schedule was pretty hectic. And we often performed for tens of thousands of people each fall, including at pro football games. So because of that packed schedule, changes were infrequent and they often required a lot of effort and adjustment on the part of the students to make that happen. So the band had a policy of only making decisions to change its schedule by unanimous vote. So if the group, the entire group didn't vote for it, it did not happen. Which made it all the more remarkable my rookie year that a group of over 200, I think it was 260 some musicians that year, in a non-competitive marching band, we didn't get, we didn't compete against other colleges. But we voluntarily agreed to do an extra practice for three hours in the pouring rain in late October when it was 37 degrees. And we voted for that willingly because we knew we needed that work to give that kind of quality performance that we wanted to give. And he, by giving us our voice and by making us a part of that process, allowed us to care and be a part of the product, not as a tool, not as a resource to be used, but as a valued member. And the long-term impact of that was even more profound because as student leaders, we also learned the foundational things that we needed for we as music teachers to teach. We literally learned this by teaching our peers. And we benefited from that when we got out into the world after college because we had experiences that we knew that we could convey to others down the line. And when you look at and I hope Mr. Scales would agree with me on this. When you look at the great sports teams and organizations that have existed, you, you find those same elephants. And I'm sorry, elements. Two of my favorite coaching figures are our current Pittsburgh Steelers head coach, Mike Tomlin, 
and San Antonio Spurs head coach Greg Popovich. And the reason why I like them so much is that they both embrace team-first concepts and leadership within their respective locker rooms that goes just way beyond what they do as head coaches. Uh, Tomlin's well known for his signature line, the standard is the standard. Um, Popovich is, is equally blunt, if not more so, about unselfishness. Uh, he likes to say no one's bigger than the team. You can't do things our way, you're not getting time here, and we don't care who you are. And I, I love how both coaches exemplify that same grit, determination, vision, and willingness to, to not allow ego to get into the way of progress, to allow others to share that workload, the spotlight, and the credit in the same way that Dr. Cassavant did when I was at IUP, right? And so the balancing act, which has been made even more difficult during COVID, is that you as a coach or as a leader or people who are leaders, student leaders, athletes have to find that way to give the youth, the less experienced on the team, their voice and their ability to not only contribute, but have that contribution be valued. And if you do that, it helps create those five C's that you speak of, and, but it also helps to provide and instill that ability to help pass that torch of leadership down to those who are going to come after them. Because our time is limited in terms of when we are at our peak and we are doing what we can. And we have so much more of a legacy when we allow others to share in the glory and to share in the success and to share in the experience that we can then pass along. What I heard you saying, and thank you so much for that response, what I heard you give us was the keys to greatness. And it was perfectly aligned, I believe, to what uh, Buddy Thornton, the Positive Social Change Agent Pro, spoke of, about that lens, about that direction, about that perception, about the co-creation, about the interplay, about working together, uh, and, and finding that leadership, finding that voice through experience, uh, through that, that seasoning, I like to call it. And so, and it helps students better understand, you know, uh, what necessary adjustments need to be made. You talked about music. You talked about modeling those skills or those, those techniques. You, I mean, and that comes, uh, that comes through uh, with practice. Uh, as a musician yourself, as a conductor yourself, there, there are chairs. There, you know, you have first chair, second chair, third chair, and on and so forth. But you cannot get through those, those different levels Right, without trial and error, right? And so you have to go through those uh, band caps. You have to have those practice sessions. You got to have those tutoring sections, sessions, the, those sectionals, those rehearsals to get to first chair. It does not just, you know, come to the talented people, right? You have to put your work in. You got to put your heart uh, in it. You got to put your sweat. You got to put your tears in it. And you got to fight for it because when it comes time to make that movement on that piece of music, on that score, if you're out of tune, you'll throw the whole movement off, right? And so moments are important. When it's time to shift, you have to be, like you said, at your ultimate um, peak, the ultimate performance, the ultimate level, right? And so, but this comes about through training, training, training. Training is what separates uh, the real from the fakes, right? <clears throat> and so, I want to thank you for that response, and I believe is the perfect uh, segue, if you will, to our next panelist, and that is uh, Mr. Harold Scales, former NFL uh, player, and Mr. Scales, please say hello to the people and tell us a little bit about what you're doing now, sir. Uh, good evening, and hello to everyone. Uh, I have been sitting home in COVID for nine, ten months. <laughs> That's what I'm doing now. But in that time, uh, I picked up a new hobby. And uh, I'm doing uh, hobbyist illustrator, specializing in sport actions. And other than that, we waiting for this COVID to be cleared so I can start international travel again uh, but that's what I've been doing uh, pre-COVID pretty much I'm in idle stage right now 
Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, like us all, you know, Mr. Skills, we are so fortunate to have you here. Um, you know, you've done so much, and we just, you know, really don't have the time uh, in this uh, this episode to talk about everything that you have done that you are doing, uh, much like the other panelists uh, here with us tonight. Again, we are just so fortunate, but you know, we know that you are a former uh, NFL player. Uh, with the Cincinnati Bengals, St. Louis Cardinals, Chicago Bears, and the Green Bay Packers, and also Vice President of the National League Players Association, Dallas uh, Chapter. And so uh, you, like the rest of the panelists, are, are very seasoned and very relevant uh, for this discussion about sports and positive development and about, you know, the different goals, about um, uh, you know the um, the challenges, the uh, using the right approaches to to get to greatness because um, you know what greatness uh, is and what it looks like and how to walk in it. And so, you know, with that being said, because there are so many young people uh, that that don't know what greatness looks like and has not been exposed to greatness, how can Okay, sports figures like yourself be more willing to share their adult power and privilege in order to make the community a better place for both young people and adults alike. That's our question for you tonight. Well, it, it's really not very difficult for the simple reason when you have achieved uh, Using the example as a professional football player, which is the ultimate of a football player, uh, and get to the Super Bowl, the the issue and the concern is really <laughs> that piece of understanding the path to get there. And we have not talked about it to the extent that there has to be some modeling. And, you know, I have taught in high school, I have mentored in high school, I have taught in college, and I've been coached professionally. And what's significantly important from my perspective is that understanding at the younger age, examples have to be identified. I can speak to it because I'm a past president of a group of guys who are professional, and we all try to talk to you. The macho motto for NFL Players Association is caring for kids. It's kind of mandated that we talk to kids, that we make a presence to kids, because we understand how we are looked at. And I can speak to it because the the reason I started wanting to play football is because a professional player came to my school and I happened to know him and the examiner said, well, oh, that's what he does? Oh, I might can do that. Yeah. But then the next piece is, how do I go about doing that? <laughs> so I'm, in, I, I, I'm playing at seven years old having fun. Okay, junior high having fun. Now I'm in high school. But in that fun, here's what's going on. And this is where coaches and teachers are very critical. Hey, they got to have some guidance. And it got to be real. We read counterfeit at youth. We read that. Just go back and think about it. You know? So... That guidance got to be sincere. And I know that it's tough because now we teach to the test, which is not good because now we're not dealing with the reality of educating this place called Earth because it's very diverse, all kind of stuff. And when we teach into the test, we got problems that we don't deal with because we should be teaching these problems. Yeah, just like coaches dealing with it in reality, it's tough for teachers. 
in the classroom. You know? So that part is significantly important. You say, man, I make it a habit to go to schools, and sometimes I get to spend more time based on if, if uh, the feeling of the emotions of, oh, yeah, I, I need to make more than a couple of visits here and create some presence because you see it and you can feel it, that sense of feel of folks wanting to talk to you and wanting some feedback and how to go about doing it. You know, in high school, learning, uh, well, it, it's no different from high school and college because you have the intrinsic and these, the, the kids that want to have it, looking for it. Those are the ones you really don't have to deal with. It's those that who are extrinsic learners is there because I got to be here. How do I motivate them? Yeah. So athletics help a lot of extrinsic learners. I can tell you it did for me because if I don't pass my classes, I'm not going to get a scholarship. <laughs> you know, understanding that. So. I'm going through high school in the area of integration. Matter of fact, I was the first group of integration with an understanding of, man, I'm trying to play professional ball. That's where I want to go. But didn't have the information or the equipment to address going about it because I didn't ask any questions. Until a teacher sit me down and says, Perlis, my husband, tells me you're a pretty good athlete. And I told her, I think so. She said, are you planning to go to college? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, uh, you can't go to college if you don't pass English. Well, she was my English teacher. You know? Now, I've never put the equation at that point in time in my life about passing my classes and going to college. So when I had that message and I saw that it was going to possibly impede my process, guess what happened? I started studying English. Started doing better in spelling. Doing my homework. You know? Now, I'm going to progress forward and I'm in college. I'm in, I'm in an instructor in college. And a baseball player tells me he's going to a Division I school and that on scholarship, I don't have to go classes. <laughs> uh, and I said, who told you that? And, and I explained to him, do you understand a coach's job is on the line on based on folks that he gives scholarships that they're supposed to win and perform at a certain level? And if that don't happen, he's going to lose his job. So you think he's going to give you a scholarship and you don't go to class? <laughs> I say, who told you my friend? Well, he's not a friend. You know? So my philosophy has always been, what is it you want to do? How do you go about doing it? And when you address those things, guess what? It ain't going to be easy. So I always, speak to goal setting and what happens in the goal setting is the short term, long term, mid and mid term goals. But there's going to be adversities. How bad do you want the goal you're trying to attain? Okay. Guess what? If you can persevere in those adversities, man, you really want this. Yeah. I use something very easy. Hey, how many of y'all got cell phones? I asked the question, how many got cell phones? Did you have to beg to get those? No. They're not cheap. But that's the same attitude that you have to have about your goals. You got to want it and you set the goals to get that. In that process, you learn how to communicate. You learn the structure of dealing with other people, and yet you're going to have a lot of losses. 
I was on a one in 10 season in my college year, but it didn't stop me. I got cut from a football team, but it didn't stop me. You gotta want it, whatever that is. The, those adversities that you develop out of athletics and staying in that process gives you a lot of creativity. There are not too many athletes that don't have some type of split personality. The competitiveness is a part of you that you, in the moment, oh, you're a different person from my perspective, and then when you through with it, you're another person. Because competition brings on a whole different attitude. And guess what? Life is like that. Whether you're on the job, dealing with your boss, the people you work with. Yeah. So my issues are concerns of, from a coaching point of view, they have a lot of control. But in the classroom, there's not as much control you need to have to teach, to teach those things that's about life and being educated at the same time. Because I'm teaching to the test that I don't see being relevant in our communication, in our educational system. Athletics is a separation of man. Anybody being in athletic meaning in any kind of competitiveness, you are going to get a better person, period. Because in the process, he or she is going to have some issues and some adversity. And guess what? A coach is there if he or she is worth their salt, will help them make the adjustment. Go ahead, Mr. Scales. Well, you know, it's from middle school to high school to freshman, sophomore college, you know, those areas, man, is where a tremendous learning curve in these stages about, man, where I want to go and what I want to do. I, ideally, you want to be able to tap on a person ambition. Well, do they really know what they want in a young age? No, they might not, but they, they think they do. So you work with that. Work with that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Critical thinking is something that we get as we get older if we get to teach it and have an understanding of critical thinking. And we don't you know, the sooner you start teaching about critical thinking, the better off you will be. Because I always have the philosophy, if you don't know where you're going, somebody else will take you where they want you to go. <laughs> you know? So that critical thinking, that earlier we can start developing that, we have a lot better Society, from my perspective, you're not happy. You're asking the questions. I need to know the information, and then you have that sense of discernment of, hey, is this work for me or not work for me? You gave us so many nuggets, and I know you can just flow. You know, you, you listen. Some people can just flow all all night long and we're gonna have to bring you back if you don't mind coming back because this wow that one question you just begin to unwrap it begin to unwrap it and i feel like i was in a sports arena i feel like i was in a, a, a stadium and and you and you answer the question by saying you we have to teach those young people how bad do you want it did you want to say something else with skills Okay, so, you know, we, we can always feed off of each other, man. Just, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 you know the, the process, is, it ain't simple, and everybody on the panel know it ain't simple, but we got to help the, the youth understand it ain't simple. You know, that, that was a, 
a video that I saw uh, when I was an uh, instructor in college and a uh, young uh, a professor was giving a lecture to the graduating high school uh, and telling about where they going and the things they looking for and here's what's going to go. And then another gentleman came in and said, Professor, uh, I want to interrupt you because I want to tell them, yes, uh, some of you want to get married, maybe 25, maybe at 40, and that's okay. Some of you, all of you want a job, you might get it the first year, you might not get it to five, five years from now, but that's okay. You know, knowing what you want, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. That's real. Wow. You know, I feel like I've been on a scavenger hunt, and I just... And I've just been going and finding and, and hunting for the good stuff. And you know, with that being said, Mr. Scales, thank you for, for your response. And definitely, we will be bringing you back. Uh, this was just so, so good. I feel like I was eating at a table. Uh, and I mean, you had a full spread. Uh, I want to pull, while we got her here, because she's a counselor, I, I want to see, I kind of want to see through her lens as well. But we have, we have Rick Bollet's wife, his lovely wife on, Jen Bollet. Please say hello to the people and tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. Uh, good evening. My name is Jen Bollet. I'm uh, currently an elementary school counselor for Colleen Independent School District. Absolutely. And we thank you for sharing uh, your knowledge and your critical thinking skills with us this evening. Like I was saying, I, I want the listeners to, to see through your, uh, your, your lens as it relates to this next question. And that question is, how can leaders and educators better understand and implement their honest opinions and ideas for positive youth development? Uh, sure, um, and I may have a little bit of a different spin on this uh, because of my position as a counselor, but uh, I kind of want to lead off with that um, a little bit from what Mr. Scales said as far as um, how well kids read us, and um, and they really do. They they read us far better than uh, than people realize, and and I think that's it. That's just human nature. It's evolution. It's how we learn. Uh, we, uh, you know, as from the time we're born, you know, up through, you know, even as adults, we're always reading other people and sort of uh, evaluating our own behavior and comparing that and looking for patterns. Um, but kids, especially, are trying to figure out. Um, how they, you know, fit into the world around them. And so they're making those judgments off of what they see and get from other people. Uh, they're very intuitive that way. And when we talk about um, uh, honest ideas, um, I think when we, if you think about all of the, all of the things that we have now, uh, for kids, we are busier now as parents and as students than we've ever been. Um, you know, things that have been sort of long-standing: um, academic clubs, marching band, football, uh, dance teams, things like that. But you know, there's also a lot of newer sports that are really newer to the K through 12 systems, like soccer. Um, golf, things like that. So when you when you think of all of the uh, academic teams we have, all of the um, the band and the sports teams, and all of these different things, um, and then you think about the current nature of academics, um, I, I think we've kind of gone the wrong way in that we're. We've gone too competitive. We've gone from benchmarks with testing to get a general idea of where kids are at to um, making it uh, competitive and almost collegiate in a way in which 
you know, we have elementary school kids in third grade stressing that if I don't pass this one test, I'm not going to get to go to fourth grade. You know, whether I get promoted is, is dependent upon this one test. And it's, it's a tremendous amount of pressure on kids. And I think um, in a lot of ways we've gone that way with other things, too. We, now we have um, competitive marching bands. Sports that always have had that competitive nature. And I liked what uh, Mr. Thornton said as well about, you know, you, you want to have that on the field. That's sort of the idea. That's what it's about. And it's healthy to kind of have uh, that competitive spirit and to be able to put that on the field. But you also have to know how to moderate that. And there's a time and a place for it. And there's a time and a place to not have it. And I think with our society being so competitive now with so many things that we've lost touch with, everything in moderation um, and I, I think that puts a tremendous strain on people and, and to loop that back around to um, kids being per, uh, perceptive they're perceptive of the fact that their teachers are stressing over tests and they're perceptive of the fact that their coaches especially in the public school setting um, you know for some of these coaches their jobs are dependent upon how well their uh, their team does. And so it kind of, it, it turns things a little bit from just a, a good-natured competitive game um, on the field and then, good, you know, good sportsmanship both on and off the field into something where it's so competitive that, as a society, we're losing track of our other values. Um, and those are the values that, you know, as a school counselor, we try to teach in school. Uh, we call them character education lessons. But those are things that, you know, we used to see far and wide and that now people are so focused on one or two areas that we've lost sight of, things like kindness, um, respect, perseverance, um, caring, empathy, just those things um, where we're looking out for each other and we're trying to help each other has actually gotten lost in I've got to fend for myself because if I don't do this, there's going to be some repercussion. And I think when you merge that um, with the way media is and technology is today, when you look at things like when, uh, when I think probably all of us went to school, we still had encyclopedias. Um, we had to go to the library. We had to do old-fashioned research to write a paper. And now um, a lot of the kids, um, Wikipedia and Google is an acceptable way to look things up. And so when you get instant answers and instant results um, and you're not investing anything in that, your brain gets trained, so to speak, for that instantaneous result, which, of course, when you're looking at a competitive nature to things like sports, you don't generally get that instantaneous result. But when you're so focused on that one win, it kind of amounts to the same end game, um, which is where we're focused on winning and not much else. And so I think the, the problem with that... Um, you know, to come back around to an honest perspective is um, you kind of have to look at systems and, um, uh, you know, there's different th different ways to look at counseling and psychology. Um, I'm very much a systems person. Uh, and by that I mean that when you look at systemics, um, you have to consider the nature of where um, individuals are coming from. When you look, you have to look at family systems. Um, to get to the root of their core beliefs. Um, and you have to look at school systems to understand, um, you know, what, what their mission is, what their goals are, um, and their priorities are. And it, when you look at, I mean, everything is really a system. You have family systems, school systems, 
community systems, state systems, the national system. There are so many different types of systems. Um, but in considering that, if you don't address the systems, then you can't really address the individuals because the individuals are answering the systems. So if all of our systems are based on winning, that's what the individuals are, you know, are going to state as well because they're not going to feel empowered to give their, their honest belief um, and opinion, even if they think that that, um, you know, could change or if that's what they believe in. If they don't believe that that's a possibility, then they're not going to feel empowered to, to, to give that. And so I guess in short what I'm saying is that to get the individuals to express their beliefs, we really have to start to address the systems. And I believe that that does start at the level of um, the schools um, and athletic programs there uh, moving out to families before moving out to everything else. And you see why we had to bring you on to this show. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, your husband must be the luckiest guy. I'll let him tell us, but you know, you yep. talked about, you see, I knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> you talked, wow. I'm gonna say this real quick because we're, we're out of time, but you talked about the different layers of the environmental perceptions of adolescents based off of their influences that was so profound that that's another podcast all by itself i can't even, i would i dare not touch that it was so rich it was so in-depth it was so qualitative i'm not touching it um but i will say wow <laughs> listen we're out of time so let's do this, let's do a round table and whoever wants to go first, they can. But just give the listening audience a word of encouragement. Uh, just a word of encouragement. I think from this discussion tonight, there's a lot of work ahead of us. And so could you just please give us a word of encouragement? Whoever wants to go first, you can go. Uh, I'll jump right in there, Isaiah. I wanted to uh, piggyback on a little bit of that. Uh, two two scenarios from my uh, my very very long decades of experience. Number one, back in high school, and I grew up in a very small town where everyone was focused on uh, community activities. But the coach of the high school football team wanted to add some perspective to teach the, the boys on the team uh, a lesson. So he had these posters made and they were, pl they were plastered all over town. And it said, please come to the football stadium on Friday night where we are gonna have an excellent performance by our wonderful marching band. And you are more than welcome to come early and stay late to enjoy the athletic activities that are taking place around the excellent band performance. And that taught a lesson to the students and got people in the right frame of mind to understand that it's all about character, it's all about perspective, and it's all about sportsmanship, that sports is not the only thing there. It's important, but it's only important in perspective. Fast forward to my pro career, and of course there's only one winner of every tournament, and I played an individual sport, and I was at a tournament, and I got knocked out early, and one of my childhood heroes also got knocked out about the same time I did. And as we were walking away from performing, he looked over and saw me and my wife and he said, you know, why don't we catch lunch and a movie? So in just one sentence, he broke down the essence of inside the lines and outside the lines. Inside the lines, we had to compete. We had to want to focus. Outside the lines, it was all about relationships, the community, and being brothers. I really appreciated every person's contribution on this panel tonight. 
and uh, I especially enjoyed uh, Buddy's advertisement for the marching band just now. Appreciate that. Uh, but what I really would encourage everyone to do is to listen to this again. Listen to it at least twice. Because not only are you hearing the different components of the five C's and, and, and much more than that, but you're also hearing from each person how they fit together and how, when done properly, can address a lot of things, uh, especially in terms of the critical thinking and, and decision-making aspects uh, that, that uh, everybody touched on, and I was grateful to hear that. Um, so I would encourage you, listen to this a couple of times, because there was a lot of material here. Um, and, and, and take that time to, to, to digest and process it, and I think you will benefit greatly from doing so. Uh, I, I really liked what um, uh, you said at the, be uh, at, at the beginning about uh, with the football coach and the band, I, I think that that is, um, I think that's a fabulous lesson. Um, and I, I, you know, I think just speaking of character and speaking of um, transparency and honesty, I think it's just re really good to start to um, to take a to take stock of where we're at right now, and um, I guess just come back around to moderation. I, th I think, you know, in a lot of respects, our society has kind of gone to different extremes, and I think in order to get people comfortable again with. Um, you know, kind of branching out and giving their their own opinions and ideas. Um, people have to be comfortable putting those out, and a lot of people, I think, aren't. Uh, you know, when we have sort of polar opposite ideas. So I I think that we just kind of need to get back to being open and accepting of um, different ideas and uh, different areas. Um, you know, maybe. For sports, that would be, be, you know, accepting the band and for the band accepting sports and so on and so forth. So I think it's just important that we um, that we value everybody's differences um, and uh, what we like to do and sort of support all of that. And I think that character building really um, starts there, you know, with being caring and being available um, for all people and kind of goes from there. Early on, it was mentioned about two professional football coaches that one thought were well loved. And, and I want to give this caveat. When you look at the successful level of the ultimate teams to get to the Super Bowl, look at the personality of the head coach, whether it's from Lombardi days to the, uh, uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers days, the New England days, look at the person that they are the coach. They define, and we're talking about grown men making millions of dollars on being directed. Yeah, so if you got grown men making millions of dollars, let's take the step down. What about my middle school kid? What about my freshman, sophomore, high school, and then in college? Direction and the personalities. Now, there's always exception to the rules. You know, because the Kansas City coach, she coach, is far different from any other Super Bowl winning coach. But that's an exception. But as a whole, look at the personalities. From grown men making millions, that same thing has to happen at the lower level. Of Again, tonight was powerful. Our panelists tonight were Buddy Thornton, 
the positive social change agent pro, Mr. Rick Bole, Jen Bole, and Mr. Hillis Skills. Good night.